one you're probably familiar with, uh, which is the Mira chair from Herman Miller, but I just want to explain two quick things about it. When, uh, uh, when, when companies start to work with cradle to cradle, in every individual case, there's usually a quick financial win starting right out the door. So it's not this thing of you have to invest a whole bunch of money and then maybe some, sooner or later you'll see some return. When Herman Miller redesigned the mirror chair, the first thing that they looked at was the connectors in the chair. They had nine, approximately 19 different connectors and they reduced that to one, which meant that they only needed one tool, which meant that they didn't need a huge supply chain with 19 suppliers providing 19 different uh, connectors, so they saved on their uh, supply chain. And it means that the chair can be disassembled in approximately five minutes. Now, the difference between five minutes and 35 minutes is the difference between profit and loss for a recycling company. So if you have a chair that takes 35 <coughs> minutes to disassemble, it usually ends up being shredded. And then you have a big mess and you have to separate all the materials. This way, it comes apart affordably and the recycling company can actually separate the materials right from the beginning. So, <coughs> that is the story of the Herman Miller uh, mirror chair, the savings that they got right out of the, the gate. Harvard uh, Business School, as well as the Journal of Industrial Ecology or Cleaner Production, I can't remember which, sorry, right now. These are both peer-reviewed publications. They did business case studies of the uh, mirror chair and how it was developed. The other thing that they did with the chair that was really interesting was, with the savings that they generated from these quick wins, they developed an internal subsidy. So they had, a, they had a manufacturing saving. They used the manufacturing saving to invest in the more difficult chemical challenge. And the more difficult chemical challenge was replacing the PVC and the arms. You know when you sit in your nice office chair and it's nice and smooth and it feels right? Well, that's because it's the wax from the PVC coming off on your clothing and your hands. That's why it's so nice. So they had to figure out a way to replicate this with another type of polymer. And it took them actually quite some time to do that, but they actually finally succeeded. But they did it because they were able to use the savings from the quick wins to do a subsidy. So this internal subsidy is what allows companies to use cradle to cradle to innovate, and that gives you your roadmap. You know, first make some money here, and then two years down the road, <coughs> generate that. And that's exactly what Deso did with their air cleaning carpet. It did exactly the same thing. They announced their intention. They started working on some things, but they actually didn't have a clue at the beginning how they were gonna have a carpet that cleaned the air. They just knew that that was going to be their goal. And it took them actually three years to get to the point where they knew how they were going to, to, uh, to actually uh, do it, which was to design microfibers into the carpet that actively capture particulates. But Deso could only do it because they increased their market share and they increased their sales by engaging their customers in the process and thereby gaining market share. So, these internal subsidies are really important uh, for uh, being able to move forward. I love this product. I love this. This is a brand new uh, product. So I just uh, need to uh, explain one thing to you. The ventilation systems in buildings, I don't know if, yeah, okay, we have it here. So these, these ventilation systems have all of these ducts. So if you are moving walls, for example, or you're repurposing the building, you have to tear out all the ducts and move them around. And by the way, has anyone ever tried to clean these things? Right? You can't. Like a lot of the ducting areas do not actually have doors where you can go in and clean the surface. So this means that after three or four years, you have a problem. You have a serious air quality problem that gets generated by all the junk that builds up in these, uh, these, these ducts. This company, which is known as FiberTech, said, well, why don't we build a textile air conditioning system made out of flexible textiles? 
So they took a cradle-to-cradle certified product, which is called Trevira. It's a synthetic. And they turned it into an air conditioning duct, which is washable and removable. Think about that for a moment, right? You can just unzip it, wash it, it's clean, put it back up. And that means if you're repurposing the building for flexible use, off it comes. You just move the connectors and you're good to go. It's amazing. It's an amazing product. But there's another feature to FiberTech that is very important for every building owner and every occupant in the building. The fabric captures particulates. So it cleans the air. It's designed to clean the air because the air goes through the fabric, not just out the end. And because the air goes through the fabric, you get a much nicer and more comfortable airflow in the room because you don't have the vents blowing out the air in a particular place. So it is completely revolutionized the way that rooms are ventilated. You get a completely different type of airflow. So you get a superior airflow. You get capture of particulates to clean the air, which you can then clean. You get a design for disassembly and for repurposing. What a magnificent, absolutely magnificent product. It has just come onto the market at the beginning of this year. So that's it. Designs for disassembly and installation. Designs for flexible reuse. Lower air velocity, improving the comfort for uh, 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 occupants. Capturing pollutants and washable to get rid of them. And design for parts and materials uh, reuse. And by the way, the colors can really add a nice feature to rooms as well. So it, it, it comes in different colors. And by the way, the colors are cradle to cradle certified as well. So. Fantastic product. I love it. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard of uh, the green roof at the Ford Motor Factory, but I just want to um, bring home to you a, a few key points. This was put on the Ford Motor Factory about 10 years ago by um, a uh, a German company called Zerofloor, and it resulted from about 20 years of research at the University of Bonn on uh, mosses, and I know that some people in Dutch, when I say moss, they go, what's that? Moss in Dutch is moose or moss? Moss. 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 Okay, good. Same stuff. <laughs> Sometimes I just pronounce it wrong. <coughs> so, um, the uh, so it took 20 years of research to optimize about five or seven different species of moss to actively capture particulates and also to, uh, to clean the water. So after 10 years, Ford has declared that the roof is exceeding all expectations. And this was the largest green roof in North America at the time uh, that it was built. But the most important thing about the roof is why? Why did they put it there in the first place? The reason they put it there was because uh, when Bill McDonough and Michael Brongard started working with Ford on their site, Ford would not tell them what was contaminating the site. Because in the United States, you have a problem with liability if you know what's on the site. So it's better not to know. So they actually couldn't tell us exactly what the contaminants were on the site. But what they could tell us was that the regulatory authorities required the company to discharge stormwater from the site at a certain level of discharge quality. And that was mandated by the local and national environmental authorities. So regardless of what was on the site, they had to discharge from the site at a certain uh, level of, uh, of quality. So, in order to guarantee that, the bill would have been somewhere around $60 million to build an industrial uh, sewage system that would capture the stormwater and process it and get it off the site. 
working with Professor Behrens and Zero Floor, they were able to not only guarantee a certain quality of water coming off the site, but also have biological remediation of the site going on at the same time for 25 to 35 million dollars less than the plant. And that's not including the operating costs. That's what sold the design <coughs> to Ford. They saved 25 to 35 million dollars before they started. That is the story of why a green roof makes sense. And by the way, it wasn't just the roof, but they did the whole property. And that's what it looks like today. A really elegant, beautiful product. And you know, it's funny because Bill um, McDonough said to Bill Ford, um, Bill Ford said, what are your design criteria? And Bill said, <coughs> Uh, how would you like to have a site where your children uh, play? At, th at that point, Bill Ford, I don't know if you've seen the film, but Bill Ford said, I almost asked them to leave the room. Because this was such a crazy thing to say. What are you talking about? A place where your children can play. But that was the design criteria. Is if you have a factory where your children can safely play, you will have a factory that is good for your employees and improves their productivity. And that, in fact, is what happened. So this criteria, a place where your children would be happy to play safely, actually ended up being a very important design criteria that led to things like this green roof. OK, so that's uh, an example of redesigning water systems. So for those of you, and there's a lot of industrial design that goes into these water systems. And there's a lot of design. Ford did a huge amount of testing on this. For example, they had to test the roof to make sure it wouldn't fly away in a storm. So this can withstand up to 110 mile per hour winds, for example. So they did all of this testing on the roof to make sure it worked properly. So it's functional as well. OK, now um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the video first. piece of furniture was actually made by pulling just start that again this piece of furniture was actually made by pulling carbon and oxygen out of air and greenhouse gas and turning it into a piece of plastic what if greenhouse gas emissions were as valuable as oil what if the products we made actually improved the environment on a continuous large scale basis we're converting greenhouse gases such as methane and carbon dioxide into biodegradable plastic plastic that requires no oil food crops and can be made into products that offer true cradle-to-cradle -cradle sustainability, starting and finishing as greenhouse gas. Right now, most plastics are made from oil and other fossil fuels. At the same time, we're emitting billions of pounds of carbon into the air every single day. Those gases can come from a range of sources, including wastewater treatment plants, landfills, and digesters. What happens is we take that gas into the tank, as it becomes a plastic pellet, and then form into things like film. So, now I'm making this strong film that's used for different applications of the packaging. But what is equally interesting is this. Ulex plastics can significantly outcompete oil-based commodity plastics on price. This is something that hasn't been done before. Typically, when you have a sustainable resin, you either have to give up on performance or pricing. We're talking about a high magnitude opportunity in the kinds of resins that we're making and the places that we're looking to 